What movie do you think is better? The Phantom Menace? Attack of the Clones. So after a few days of this poll being up, it turns out around 55% of you chose The Phantom Menace over Attack of the Clones. If you haven't seen the video already, I recently spoke about The Phantom Menace 24 years later. Let's just say I wasn't too kind to the movie. However, now that it has been 21 years since the release of Attack of the Clones, how have my opinions on this movie changed? By the end of the video, I'm going to give you a definitive answer as to which movie is better, The Phantom Menace or Attack of the clones. Are 55% of you correct or are you wrong? But in order to give you a definitive answer, we must dive deep into the film. With that being said, hello everybody and welcome to another video. My name is The Goldman and today we are discussing Attack of the Clones all these years later. Now, just like I did with The Phantom Menace, I'd like to discuss the plot of Attack of the Clones. What's so unique about the prequels is that what's going on is far more complicated than the original trilogy. The plot of the three original trilogy films are all rather simple. Episode 4, Destroy the Death Star. Episode 5, Escape the Empire. Episode 6, Save Han and Destroy the Death Star again. The Phantom Menace is somewhat simple with the plot being to stop the Trade Federation from invading Naboo, but it also has a whole chunk of the movie devoted to Anakin and another another good portion of the movie about the politics behind who is Chancellor. Attack of the Clones is the first time a Star Wars movie doesn't have a simple one sentence plot. Now this is by no means a bad thing, I applaud George Lucas for wanting to tell a unique story. After rewatching the film again, where I believe Lucas struggles the most is telling this grand story of the prequels in the span of only three movies. The original trilogy was clearly more focused on the characters rather than the plot, while Lucas clearly was more focused on the fall of democracy theme of his story rather than the characters' plights in the prequels. Not saying he ignored his characters, I just feel if I had to rank George Lucas's top priorities with the prequel trilogy, discussing the fall of the Republic was more interesting to him than Anakin's turn to the dark side. And who knows, maybe I'm wrong. So Attack of the Clones is really about getting the Clone Wars started. So what is the plot? Hmm. A plot is usually a goal that certain people want to achieve. Is the plot simply uncovering the secrets of the Separatists? Is the plot the attempt to stop a war from happening but our heroes ultimately fail? So I don't know how to summarize the plot of this movie. The movie is pretty much just a series of events that lead to the start of a war, as opposed to the characters struggling to achieve an overarching goal. So before I mentioned Lucas struggling to tell the story in only three movies, the reason I think this is because he pretty much only has one movie to convey to the audience why a war is brewing, who are the factions of said war, and all the events that lead up to said war. This is really hard to do in only one movie. Most of the times when wars start, it's usually either an event that catalyzes one side to mobilize, or a series of smaller political decisions that leads to one side declaring war. Lucas wanted to go down the latter route, and again that's just not easy to do. Certain events or concepts are far easier to dramatize than others. The show House of the Dragon devoted its entire 10 episode first season that chronologically took place over 20 years to tell us how a war started. You know why there are a lot more stories about World War II than World War I? It's because the events of World War II are far easier to turn into a conventional story. So if you want to tell a story about how a galactic war begins in only 2 hours and 20 minutes, there are a lot of shortcuts that you need to take that other movies don't usually need to take. So let's discuss how Lucas trying to start a war and where I I feel he faltered. But before I do that, I need to specify one thing. There are a lot of questions I'm going to ask that this movie does not answer. The Clone Wars show, on the other hand, does a brilliant job at answering these questions. I am not here to analyze the lore of how the Clone Wars started. I am here to analyze Attack of the Clones. So yes, I have seen the Clone Wars, and I know how that show answers these questions. But the movie, Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones, does not answer these questions. So don't tell me, oh, you need to watch the Clone Wars to get the answers or this guy clearly hasn't watched The Clone Wars. When analyzing a film within a trilogy, I shouldn't have to watch an animated show to get the answer
answers I'm looking for. Is that fair? Okay, good. Let's begin. So the opening crawl can pretty much be summarized by, a civil war is brewing within the Republic, the Jedi are overwhelmed, and a vote will take place on if an army should be created to help the Jedi. So shortly after the opening crawl, there's a brief discussion Palpatine has with the Jedi where he says the Republic will not split into two, and Mace Windu fears that the Jedi cannot protect the Republic from the Separatists. So here are my questions. One, and this is the most important question, why are there Separatists? Why do systems want to secede from the Republic? The main foundation for why this war is starting is never established. Based on this movie, I couldn't tell you why systems want to secede. It's hard for the audience to be invested in the origins of a war when we don't know what said war is about. The original trilogy had it pretty easy. There's an empire, they are evil, rebels are fighting against tyranny. It's as simple of a war as you can get, and the audience understands. The sequel trilogy also struggles with this the same way the prequels do. There's an organization named the First Order they want to take over the Republic. Why? We don't ever really know why. The assumption is that the First Order is just the Empire and they want to rebuild. Okay, but that's still leaving a lot of information out. Going back to Attack of the Clones, I've heard a lot of people say that the reason the Separatists are seceding is because the Republic is corrupt. That's just not conveyed in the movie. You could argue that the Phantom Menace did convey a corrupt Republic, and that's an interesting point, but that doesn't hold water because the crisis on Naboo is never mentioned as an example why the Separatists want to secede. All it would have taken is one conversation from Count Dooku talking about the Naboo crisis, and a lot more things start to make sense, but that doesn't happen. Also, it's kind of hard to use the Naboo crisis as an example when the Chancellor of the Republic was a Naboo Senator, and the current Naboo Senator is described as a Republic Loyalist. How can Separatists use the Naboo crisis as a reason for secession when the current Naboo representatives are not? So this is one of my largest criticisms of the movie. We don't know why there's a Separatist movement. Moving on, the opening crawl says that Count Dooku has made it difficult for the limited number of Jedi Knights to maintain peace and order in the galaxy. What exactly are the Jedi overwhelmed with? Are there current battles going on between the Jedi and the Separatists? Are the Jedi currently in a bunch of negotiations with Separatists that aren't going well? Have there been threats by the Separatists to attack? I'll be fair, this is a little nitpicky, but I think it would have added urgency to the movie if we knew why the Jedi were overwhelmed, or if we actually saw Jedi being overwhelmed. Say Attack of the Clones began with a similar opening to The Phantom Menace where the Jedi go to negotiate, but then they get attacked by Separatists and actually die. Then there are discussions about the creation of a clone army and the Jedi are overwhelmed. There's more weight behind the discussions because we see the consequences of the Jedi not getting the help they need. If Lucas had more time, I'm sure he would have done something like this, but again, since this is only one movie, there is so much you can cover. So these two questions I have that Lucas had to gloss over puts the film in a tough spot to begin the movie. Now when it comes to the politics behind the start of the Clone Wars, that's all the movie explores for the first hour and a half of the movie. Because after this one scene with Palpatine and the Jedi where they discuss politics, the next 90 minutes are devoted to Anakin protecting Padme and Obi-Wan going on an investigation to find out who is trying to kill Padme. And then Obi-Wan gets captured which pretty much leads to the start of the war. This may be a hot take, but I don't think this movie has enough politics. A lot of it was glossed over so the story could focus more on Anakin and Padme. Had there been a bit more politicking and more development of the Separatists, I feel the movie could have been much better. Now for the rest of this section of my video, I need to discuss maybe the most convoluted part of the entire trilogy, and that's Palpatine's plan. All of the events of the prequel trilogy are predicated around Palpatine's plan. In movie 1, he just needs to become Chancellor. In movie 2, he needs to start a war. And in movie 3, he needs to declare himself Emperor, kill all the Jedi, and turn Anakin to the dark side. There isn't really anything too convoluted about Palpatine's plan in The Phantom Menace, but once we get to Attack of the Clones, my head starts spinning. So Palpatine needs to start a war and give himself wartime powers. In order for this to happen, he needs to pass the vote to create an army of the Republic and get said army. Thankfully, over a decade ago, Palpatine had Dooku secretly order the creation of a clone army. Now Palpatine's other long-term plan is to turn Anakin to the dark side. What's so unclear about the prequels is the extent of Palpatine's plan. Was this his exact plan all the way from The Phantom Menace? When he met Anakin at the end of the movie, did he know that he was going to try to turn him to the dark side? The beginning of Attack of the Clones leads me to believe that from at least the beginning of that movie, he did have intentions of trying to turn him to the dark side. When the Jedi say Padme needs to be protected, Palpatine is the one who suggests Padme stay under the protection of Anakin and Obi-Wan. Perhaps someone you're familiar with. An old friend, like Master Kenobi. 
I don't think it's a coincidence that Palpatine made this suggestion. Now, if he did have sinister intentions behind requesting Anakin and Obi-Wan protect Padme, how does he know that Padme will ultimately be the catalyst for Anakin's downfall? We do clearly see Palpatine and Anakin have a close relationship. In Revenge of the Sith, Palpatine is also aware of the death of Anakin's mother. Remember what you told me about your mother? So it's reasonable to assume that Palpatine knows a fair amount about Anakin's struggles, but prior to Attack of the Clones, did Palpatine know that Anakin had a crush on Padme? Honestly, this one suggestion from Palpatine in the beginning of the movie makes so many things more confusing, because you cannot convince me that Palpatine just happened to ask Anakin to go protect Padme. So if Palpatine wants Anakin to fall in love with Padme, then he needs Padme alive for the time being at least. So if he needs Padme alive, then why does he have Dooku send an assassin to go kill Padme? Twice! Did Dooku just want to kill Padme on his own accord and Palpatine wasn't aware? I guess that can make sense. But even if Palpatine didn't orchestrate this plan, he is aware that Padme's life is under threat after the first assassination attempt, so why would he willingly let Dooku continue letting Jango Fett to try and kill Padme? Of course, this can all make sense if Palpatine at the time wasn't trying to get Anakin and Padme to fall in love, but then why would Palpatine suggest Obi-Wan and Anakin protect Padme? Was it just one idea of many he had to turn Anakin to the dark side? And once he somehow found out that Anakin loves Padme, did he just decide to roll with it? See how this is all so goddamn confusing? But Palpatine's plan to turn Anakin to the dark side is far less confusing than his plan to start a war. So remember, Palpatine has a clone army waiting on standby, but he can't just summon the army at once. How sus would it be if there were all these debates about creating an army and Palpatine was like, oh, by the way, I have millions of clones I ordered 10 years ago ready to fight for us. People would probably accuse him of trying to start a war, which he was. So Palpatine needs some miracle that somehow the clone army would fall into his lap. I guess what he could do is have Dooku tell the Kaminoans to simply offer an army that could help the Republic. But isn't that really weird that the one planet that was removed from the Republic archives was secretly building an army that could fight half the galaxy? What would stop other systems from just casually building their own armies in secret? Anyway, I'm getting off topic. So the way Palpatine gets his wish is because Jango Fett wanted to assassinate Padme, but instead he sends Zam Wessel. But after Zam Wessel fails to do so, instead of going out of his way to kill Padme, Jango Fett kills Zam Wessel instead, and Obi-Wan uses the dart that killed Zam Wessel to track down Jango Fett, who happened to be staying on Kamino, which happened to have the clone army that Palpatine needs to reveal to the galaxy. And then after Obi-Wan reports to the Jedi that there's a secret clone army, he gets captured by the Separatists, which start a major battle which gives Palpatine the AOK -okay to start a war. And boom, just like that, Palpatine's entire plan worked. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. See how many things had to go right for Palpatine's plan to succeed? I could forgive this movie if Palpatine didn't appear to have a strict plan, and to those he say he doesn't, one of the final scenes of the movie is Palpatine saying, Everything is going according to plan. Everything is going as planned. What plan? So many things completely out of his control had to happen in order for this to work. And it did! So even though Palpatine's plan is the most convoluted thing I have ever heard, does that necessarily mean the plot of this movie is bad? No, it does not. I do find discovering the clone army being tied into the hunt for Padme's killer to be rather odd, but one aspect of these events that I find to be funny is that certain plot points are completely ignored. Like how Anakin was tasked with protecting Padme, but then he proceeds to bring her to a war zone on Geonosis, and then at the end of the movie, the Jedi still send Anakin to protect Padme even though he completely failed at his mission the first time. Also, Obi-Wan spends more than half the movie investigating who killed Padme, only to find out it was a bounty hunter, and he doesn't question who hired said bounty hunter to kill Padme. Also, the Jedi are just complete idiots. Why they would just happily accept some random army that was created in secrecy is baffling. No further investigation into why Sifo DS asked for the creation of a clone army. I'm getting a bit too into nitpicky territory here, but the whole events that are taking place on Geonosis are just so strange. Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Padme are captured. Instead of executing them, they want to put on a show in front of an entire arena of Geonosians. I get that they want to make the execution fun, but shouldn't they have snipers on guard in case things go wrong and all three of them manage? to survive, and then out of a blue a bunch of Jedi show up. How they managed to sneak into the arena, I have no clue. This is a planet filled entirely of Geonosians and a few Separatist leaders. If you saw this walking through the admissions line to buy a ticket into the arena, you'd probably be sussed out if you were a Geonosian. So yeah, a lot of the plot is kinda silly, but overall it's fine, I suppose. What really matters is the execution of said plot and story, so let's talk about that. Before I continue on with the rest of this video, only 6.5% of my viewers are subscribed to this channel. So if you're enjoying this video, please consider subscribing for more content like this. Thank you.
Execution is a term that is often thrown around when it comes to criticism of the prequels. The prequels had a great story that had some execution problems, is the common sentiment. I wanted to dive deeper into this because I think most people just point to the poor dialogue as the source behind its poor execution, but I find it to be a bit more than that. Also, I'm not talking about the execution of certain ideas, I'm talking about the execution of aspects of filmmaking. Of the six George Lucas Star Wars movies, Attack of the Clones is the longest, even longer than Revenge of the Sith. Now, what you could argue is something akin to what I said above, that Attack of the Clones does have a lot of story to cover, and because of that, it ended up being the longest of the six. But that's not true. Unfortunately, Attack of the Clones suffers from some horrid pacing issues. In good movies, most scenes advance both the plot and the characters at the same time. Now, a movie like The Phantom Menace has borderline no character work, so all it had to do was advance the plot. Attack of the Clones does attempt to build some of its characters, but unfortunately, a lot of the scenes in this movie only build the characters or the plot, almost never both, and sometimes neither. One of the opening action sequences of the movie is the Coruscant speeder chase sequence. This is a sequence that, while a little too long, does advance the plot and build the characters a little bit. This is one of the few scenes in the movie that develops Anakin and Obi-Wan's relationship, something that is important to the trilogy. After that, we get around 40 minutes of exposition scenes, most of which either develop the characters, advance the plot, or are completely useless. Very few of them actually accomplish both developing the characters and advancing the plot at the same time. Now, there are some scenes that pretty much need to happen but don't add anything to the movie, like the conversation between Anakin and Palpatine. The sole purpose of this scene is to establish some sort of relationship between Palpatine and Anakin. Nothing that is said in this scene is particularly important, it's just important that we see these two together. A scene like this can't be removed, but it's a pretty bad scene because I would argue it doesn't develop the characters or advance the plot. But now I want to go through some scenes that I feel could have been removed entirely. One is this conversation between Yoda, Obi-Wan, and Mace Windu. All that's accomplished here is that Obi-Wan thinks Anakin is a bit arrogant, and Mace Windu needs to remind the audience that Anakin is the chosen one. Both could have been easily accomplished in a different scene. For one, we have already seen numerous examples of Obi-Wan being frustrated with Anakin, so do we really need to see him complain about Anakin here? And having Mace Windu say, remember Obi-Wan, Anakin is the chosen one who can bring balance to the Force, is just bad dialogue. Obi-Wan is Anakin's master, of course he knows this. This, so this scene can be pretty much removed. Another scene that is even more useless is Obi-Wan in the Jedi Library. The only thing that is accomplished here is that Obi-Wan learns Kamino isn't part of the archives. The next time we see Obi-Wan when he talks to Yoda, he just tells Yoda this anyway. So did we really need to devote a minute of the movie to Obi-Wan learning this when he tells both Yoda and the audience the same information a few minutes later? I don't think it was necessary. Another scene is Padme talking politics to the Queen of Naboo. I actually don't know the point of the scene. Padme confesses some fears that we all know she already has, and then we see Anakin act like a child around her. This scene only makes it harder to believe that Padme would fall in love with him because he was incredibly rude. Also, the next scene Anakin and Padme have together is when they have their first kiss, so to go from Anakin being rude to Padme to them having their first kiss is a major tonal issue. And speaking of tonal issues, that's another thing this movie somewhat struggles with. When movies have multiple plot lines going on at once, it's important that your tone doesn't shift each time you go from scene to scene. There's this great behind-the-scenes clip of The Phantom Menace where one of the Lucasfilm employees expresses this very concern to George Lucas. In a space of about 90 seconds, you know, you go from lamenting the death of, you know, a hero to escape, to slightly comedic with Jar Jar, you know, to mm -hmm. Anakin returning with and this is something that apparently Lucas didn't get feedback for with Attack of the Clones. In the span of 10 minutes, we get scenes of Obi-Wan listening to Separatist politics, then Anakin's mom dying, then Obi-Wan complaining about bad Wi-Fi, and then Anakin's confession that he murdered a bunch of women and children. See how the Obi-Wan scenes here kinda clash with the more heavy-hearted scenes of Anakin? It would have been far better for the pacing if a scene like Obi-Wan getting captured was intermingled with the Anakin scenes here. So consistent tonality is something that Lucas struggles with in this movie. Now, of course, as as I said before, a lot of the execution issues are related to the dialogue, and unfortunately pretty much every example of bad dialogue is shared between Anakin and Padme, so instead of just talking about it here, let's move on and discuss Anakin and Padme as a whole. Anakin and Padme are the heart of Attack of the Clones. Usually with these types of videos, I discuss a wide variety of characters, but with Attack of the Clones, all there is to talk about really is Anakin and Padme. Could I talk about Obi-Wan? 
Sure, but all he does is either lecture Anakin or wander around in exposition scenes. Not really much character work. There isn't much to talk about with the Jedi other than that they're loathsome assholes. I'm not really going to go into Dooku because I don't find there to be anything interesting about him. So let's focus on Anakin and Padme. There's really two camps when it comes to this relationship. One is the take that's been present since 2002 and it's that these two have no chemistry and they have the cringiest relationship ever. The other camp is that this is secretly a perfect relationship and Anakin is one of the deepest and most well-written characters in the Star Wars franchise. Granted, most of this discourse is about Anakin rather than Padme, but with that being said, I'm going to tell you that my thoughts on Anakin are split right down the middle. And by middle, I mean right at the 59 minute mark of the movie, which is a little bit before halfway through. Before this point in the movie, I find most of Anakin's scenes to be rather insufferable. After this point in the movie, I actually quite enjoy it and find a lot of it to be criminally underrated. Anakin's arc in this movie is kinda split into three parts. First is his reunion with Padme and falling in love, second is his search for his mother, and third is the battle on Geonosis. This first third where he and Padme fall in love with each other, I cannot relate with at all. Since I am the mayor of Fair, I watched a handful of video essays on Anakin. Excluding the Clone Wars, I do not relate with movie Anakin at all, and since loving the prequels is the cool thing to do these days, I wanted to educate myself on prequel fans' points of view. What do they see in movie Anakin that they love so much, especially in regards to Attack of the Clones? I'm going to try my best here to summarize some of these major points. The big reason why Anakin appears so awkward in his interactions with Padme is because the Jedi have never taught Anakin how to properly handle his emotions. When Anakin was young, he met this beautiful girl. For 10 years, all he could do is idolize her and fantasize about this girl. For 10 years, all he did was build up this image of Padme as this perfect woman. Almost any teenage boy can understand what this is like. But since the Jedi don't care to help teenage boys with their emotions, Anakin struggled with this. So he reunites with Padme after a decade, and as he says, it's intoxicating. He goes on to say and do rather cringe things, like how he tells Padme she has grown more beautiful. Grown more beautiful, I mean or how he wishes he could dream about Padme. I'd much rather dream about Padme. Or this creepy ass look he gives her for some reason. Why not? Or how he tells Padme he loves dreaming about her. You're exactly the way I remember you in my dreams. Or how he doesn't like sand. I don't like sand. Or how he begs to be with her. I will do anything that you ask. No one has clearly taught Anakin how to properly talk to girls you're interested in. To me, this argument makes complete sense. If you meet kids who have been sheltered their whole lives and don't go out much, they're usually quite socially awkward. So Anakin not having the best social skills here makes complete sense. But this is where I tend to differ. Movies are not instruction manuals. I don't care if certain things make sense. Just because something is logically sound doesn't make it the best decision for a story. I get invested in movies and shows and books not because things 100% of the time make sense. I get invested because I'm either entertained or emotionally moved by something. In space, there is no sound, so technically every space battle in Star Wars doesn't make sense. But I think we can all agree that watching space battles with explosion sounds and blaster fire makes it far more entertaining. So yes, Anakin's actions make sense given his backstory, but by making sense, Anakin comes across as a weirdo and a creep most of the time. In reality, most of the reason Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones exist narratively is to pay off two moments in Revenge of the Sith. The first being that Anakin would turn to the dark side to save his wife, and the second being the tragedy behind Anakin burning alive. For Revenge of the Sith to work, we the audience need to buy that Anakin would turn to the dark side and kill all these Jedi and betray the Republic just to keep his wife alive. It's like with The Last Jedi, if you don't buy that Luke would have this reaction to seeing visions of his nephew turning to the dark side, then you're most likely not gonna like the movie. But if you do buy it, there is a much better chance you will. This is why movies are inherently subjective. If you watch the entire prequel trilogy and you totally understand and empathize with Anakin turning to the dark side, that's awesome. But some of us may not be sold on it and thus it's harder for us to enjoy the movie. Attack of the Clones needs to sell me on Anakin and Padme becoming so in love that in the next movie, Anakin will betray everything for her. Unfortunately, this movie does not sell me on that because of the way he acts. He whines all the time. It's not fair. 
He complains about Obi-Wan constantly. It's all Obi-Wan's fault. He's rude to Padme a few times. Excuse me. He's creepy quite a bit, and he acts like such a simp around her. So again, the way Anakin acts here makes sense, but because it makes sense, I don't find that these two would fall in love. I'm gonna pose a question to the ladies here in the audience, if there even are any. Prior to this moment in the movie where Anakin tells Padme he needs to save his mother, which again is around the 59 minute mark, what about Anakin and the way he acts makes you think you could fall in love with him? I could maybe name a few things. For one, Hayden Christensen was certainly an attractive dude. He definitely cares for Padme, that's for sure. He carries her bags for her, that's very gentlemanly. They have a cute romantic picnic together. He cares for his mother, that's always a good sign. Besides that, what else? I get people are into different things, but I just don't see how someone could fall in love with this version of Anakin. You know what movie I watched recently really made me think about Attack of the Clones? You're gonna laugh at this, but the Titanic. Before you call me insane, just stick with me for a moment. Rose is someone who is a part of the wealthy class, a class that she frankly hates. They expect certain things from her that she doesn't want to do. They make her act in a way she doesn't want to act. They won't let her love the person that she wants to love, and they hold her back in a lot of ways. Doesn't that sound like Anakin? Anakin may not hate the Jedi, but he certainly feels held back by them. He is told to act in a way he doesn't want to act, and they don't allow him to love the person he wants to love. When Jack meets Rose, he embodies everything that makes makes Rose happy. Can the same thing not be said with what Padme does for Anakin? The big difference between these relationships is, of course, the execution. In Titanic, the key moment the movie needs to sell you on is that Rose would jump back on a sinking ship so she could be with the person she loves. I totally buy that moment because the movie did the legwork to prove to me why Rose loves Jack. But with the Star Wars prequels, I cannot say the same. I also want to say it's not impossible for Anakin to be kind of weird and buy into this relationship. There are a few easy tweaks this movie could have made that would make Anakin far more relatable. One small example would be when Anakin blurts out and argues with Obi-Wan right in front of Padme. This moment makes Anakin seem like a child. But what if instead of having Anakin blurt out, he just sits there in silence but we can visibly see he's frustrated with Obi-Wan. And when Obi-Wan and Padme walk away, we see him vent his frustrations to Jar Jar. This way the same narrative beat is accomplished, but Anakin doesn't seem like a child. We see how frustrated he is with Obi-Wan. He doesn't need to tell the audience. That's just one example of how Anakin could have been far less insufferable. Now, as I stated before, the moment 59 minutes into the movie is the turning point for how I feel about Anakin. Because after this moment, I am totally on board with the way Anakin acts. It's impossible to put into words, but there's just something about the relationship a boy has with his mother. Especially a boy like Anakin who grew up with no one but his mother. Anakin is having visions of his mom dying. I get that feeling of saying that you have no other choice where nothing else in the world matters. He needs to save his mom. So he and Padme go to Tatooine, and every scene on Tatooine I love. When he's sitting at the table with the Lars family, he doesn't blurt out how angry or upset he is, he just sits there and gets up and says, I'm going to save my mother. You don't need characters expressing how they feel all the time. Like the example I used before, sometimes just sitting in silence is more powerful than any word spoken. So Anakin goes off to find his mother. By the way, this shot is beautiful. One of the best shots in Star Wars. So Anakin finds his mother and we get what is easily the best scene in the movie. What makes this scene so great is that we see Anakin at his most human. Throughout the movie, Anakin is telling us how he feels a lot. He tells us how much he loves Padme and he tells us how frustrated he is with Obi-Wan. But given the events of the previous movie, it is clear that Anakin loves his mother. He doesn't need to tell us, he's shown us. Him being torn away from his mother was evidently hard and was the beginning of his path down the dark side. When he has these visions of his mother dying, Dying, it only makes sense that he wants to save her. Shmi is the last person of Anakin's family, the last person that will unconditionally love him. Padme understands this, so she lets him go find his mother. One of the reasons I appreciate Attack of the Clones is because the movie has these emotionally vulnerable scenes. These scenes are usually scenes where two or more characters are talking to each other, or maybe a character is alone, but what's important is that they are emotionally exposed. They aren't talking about the plot or what's going on with the state of the galaxy 
galaxy, they are just talking about something that is troubling them or troubling the other person. The story slows down and you really get to see what the characters are thinking, how they are feeling overall and what's bothering them. In The Phantom Menace, you don't really get any of these scenes between Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon, but in Attack of the Clones, you get a lot of these scenes with a lot of pairings of characters, especially Anakin and Padme. As cringy as it is, the I don't like sand line is an emotionally vulnerable moment for Anakin. With Anakin and Obi-Wan, when Anakin is talking about how excited he is to see Padme again, it's a scene that strengthens the relationship between the two characters. When two characters are having an emotionally vulnerable scene, not only do we learn more about the individual characters, but also the relationship between the two characters. We mostly get these kinds of scenes with Anakin and Padme, and a lot of the lines between Anakin and Padme are kinda weird, but at least we get to learn about the characters and their relationship. When Anakin gets to the Tusken Raider camp, he sneaks in and finds his mom. It's a brief scene, no doubt, but I think almost anyone in the audience can empathize with Anakin. People forget Anakin is only 19 years old in this movie. He's still basically a kid. He chats with his mother briefly by telling her how much he loves her. Shmi tells Anakin how proud she is of him and how handsome he is. It's a sweet moment. But what happens next, I think, really works. We get this desperate tone from Anakin. He just wants to be with his mother again. Once he realizes that she's dead, he shifts gears. We don't get any of that George Lucas dialogue of people saying how they feel. We get silence. That rage. He walks outside and strikes down the two Tusken guards. For the first time, we see Darth Vader overtake Anakin Skywalker. That raw emotion we get from Anakin is fantastic because it's real. We can all relate to this anger. He just wants revenge against the people who murdered his mother. And revenge is an emotion every human being can empathize with. Anakin turns back to the Lars homestead and he is unraveling. Rightfully so. A lot of people crap on the women and children too scene. I love picking on the prequels as much as the next guy, but not this scene. It surely doesn't do anything for me to understand why Padme would fall in love with him, but this is totally how I would expect someone who just lost their mother to act. Especially since Anakin blames himself, and that's key. Anakin feels he could have saved his mom had he been more powerful. Come Revenge of the Sith, I buy that Anakin would turn to the dark side to gain the power to save someone he loves, because he felt powerless here and that's an awful feeling. This entire sequence on Tatooine doesn't progress the plot one bit, but it does a wonderful job at developing Anakin. The final third of the movie doesn't do much for me with Anakin, it's all pretty much just action and cheeky banter, which I enjoy. I will say that the scene where Padme says she truly, deeply loves Anakin is some of the worst dialogue I have ever heard. Also, this whole movie we are constantly told how Anakin has become so powerful. Palpatine says Anakin is the most gifted Jedi he has ever met. You are the most gifted Jedi I have ever met. And Obi-Wan says shit like his abilities have made him arrogant. His abilities have made him, well, arrogant. But not once in the movie do we actually see this until the end at Geonosis. And frankly, nothing Anakin does here is all that impressive. It's fine action for sure, but no, I don't buy that he is this extremely gifted Jedi from this movie. Anakin goes on to fight Dooku, loses, then proceeds to marry Padme. Having them get married is beyond stupid. It's just so unnecessary. They couldn't just remain in love and not be married? It's so cheesy. And those are my thoughts on Anakin. I really like half of it, and the other half, not so much. This section is, however, about Anakin and Padme. So let's talk about Padme. What I want to discuss with her is to attempt to explain why she loves him. All video, I have constantly discussed how I don't think any woman would fall in love with someone who acts like Anakin. But like before, I've done my research, and this is why I think Padme loves Anakin. Sure, you guys could simply say that it's bad writing and that Lucas simply needed these two to fall in love for the story to work, but I don't like to accept those kinds of answers. George Lucas is a deep thinker, and while he doesn't always do the best job at conveying those ideas, he always has an idea for everything. So I actually feel that there's a strong foundation for the basis of their relationship. It wasn't executed well at all, of course, but Lucas set up a great story overall. Essentially, Anakin and Padme are both living a very similar life. Anakin and Padme both belong in institutions where they need to compress and hold back their emotions. This is essentially how they connect and fall in love. Jedi cannot have attachments, so Anakin essentially is being told not
not to let his feelings get in the way of his choices, to just let go. Anakin tries to do some mental gymnastics when he tells Padme the importance of compassion and in a way that is a form of love, but of course Anakin knows the Jedi would never allow him to love a woman. So that is how the Jedi and that institution suppress Anakin and his emotions. What about Padme? Padme was raised as a politician since she was a child and became a queen at around 14. She tells Anakin about her time as a child and how she was kind of bred for this role. She was raised to serve, to be selfless, to think of others and the good of others before herself. She cannot let her feelings get in the way of the choices she needs to make. And for about 24 years of her life, she's never really done anything for herself. So Padme and Anakin are both extremely similar in that respect. Both made commitments to orders at a young age before they could get a true understanding of what those commitments meant. Both need to suppress their feelings in order to live up to the commitment they made. Both are surrounded by people who don't understand the challenges of this. All the other Jedi joined the order pretty much as babies. That's why all they know is to be completely selfless. It's different for Anakin who was taken from his mother when he was nine. Padme is surrounded by people and politicians who probably weren't thrust into politics at a young age and cannot relate to that experience. When Anakin and Padme get together, they inherently understand each other when no one else does. The struggles each other are going through and not letting their feelings get in the way of anything is how they fall in love. When they kiss for the first time and Padme says she shouldn't have done that, it's her whole upbringing conflicting with what she wants in the moment. This mini vacation for Anakin and Padme allows them to be selfish for once in their lives. When Anakin breaks down after his mother dies, Padme sort of understands the outburst of everything that has been building up. This is also why Anakin is so worried about losing her. He's losing the only person who understands him and who can relate with him. So that's essentially my reason for why Padme may love Anakin. I'm not entirely convinced because the movie greatly struggles with its execution, but I have a good feeling this is what Lucas was going for. The relationship between Anakin and Padme had a lot of potential. For many, this movie and their relationship works, and that's great. But unfortunately, for a lot of others, myself included, there was a lot left to be desired. In each of my three prequel trilogy videos, I discuss something that applies to the trilogy as a whole rather than the individual movie. With The Phantom Menace, I spoke about how online discourse of film changed after that movie's release. When I inevitably do Revenge of the Sith, I will talk about George Lucas and his influence on things, but with this video, I want to discuss the world building. Even some of the biggest prequel haters out there point to the world building of the prequels as one of its strongest aspects, and I would tend to agree. With the original trilogy, the world building was fantastic there too, but the scope of that trilogy was rather small in scale. Throughout that trilogy, we visit seven planets, including Alderaan. Pretty much each of those planets are backwater worlds, and most of those planets are either completely deserted or have wildlife roaming around. What the prequel trilogy did excellently is widen the scope of the Star Wars universe. And this doesn't just mean including more planets, it's about fleshing out these planets and having them feel like real lived-in places. First, First and most importantly is Coruscant. Coruscant is the capital of the Republic and is the heart of all the political dealings in the galaxy. While I find most of the Senate scenes to be insufferably boring, it still nonetheless gives us an idea of how the galaxy is being run. We have the Jedi Temple, the Senate Building, Palpatine's Building, Padme's Apartment, the Lower Levels, Dexter's Diner, this random ass place, and probably a few other places that I missed. Coruscant may be the most developed planet in all of Star Wars, either that or Tatooine. We also get planets like Naboo, which are rather unique in the Star Wars universe when you think about it. How many planets in Star Wars can you definitively say have two or more different cultures inhabiting it? We have the Naboo people and the Gungans down in the oceans. That's a layer that makes Naboo feel like a real place. When we go to Tatooine, I like how Lucas decided to set the story of the Phantom Menace in a new part of the planet. Mos Espa is different from Mos Eisley, which is different from Jabba's palace. I could go on and on about the different worlds the prequel trilogy introduced, but you guys get my point. The prequel trilogy physically expanded the Star Wars universe. To shift gears a bit, let's talk about some of the world building I'm not too fond of, and that's almost anything with the Jedi. It's hard to critique an aspect of world building from a movie that's been out for over 20 years, because said world building has been a part of the canon for that 20 years. It's like talking about Return of the Jedi and saying Leia being Luke's sister is kinda lazy and dumb. It's been a part of the Star Wars canon for 40 years, and the entire sequel trilogy 
trilogy couldn't exist if Leia wasn't the daughter of Darth Vader. So with the prequels, there are a lot of aspects I find to be rather dumb. Sure, there are the takes as old as time that I happen to share, midichlorians are dumb, and the Jedi not being allowed to love is also quite silly. I mentioned this in my Phantom Menace video in depth, the concept of a chosen one is something that I loathe, but what I wanted to discuss the most is the downfall of the Jedi. I stated earlier in the video that I think Lucas was most interested in telling a story about how democracies fall. In the case of the prequels, the Jedi losing their way and allowing Palpatine to rise is a key part of that. I'll give Lucas credit that this was an interesting approach to the prequels, to have the Jedi to blame for their own downfall. You see how corrupt they have become and how mingled with the galactic politics they are? So while it's definitely interesting and there are a lot of layers to it, I don't like it at all. When watching the originals, I always pictured the downfall of the Jedi to be this tragic event. They were betrayed by Anakin and fell when the Empire rose to power. Now, some of you may say that the current Order 66 is tragic, and sure, it kind of is, but this moment to me at least isn't sad because the Jedi did it to themselves. If an innocent man is walking down the street and then they get shot and robbed, you would say that is tragic, correct? Yes. Now picture the same scenario, but this person purposefully went into a high crime neighborhood at night to film a TikTok of him waving multiple hundred dollar bills over his head. Would you say him getting mugged is tragic? It's still sad because no one deserves to be mugged, but the dude did put himself in an idiotic situation. That's kinda how I feel about the Jedi. Order 66 should be this really depressing moment, but all I can think is that they did it to themselves. There are so many red flags throughout the prequels that the Jedi could have seen but missed because they're idiots. And the Clone Wars only makes this worse. They are fully aware at one point that a Sith Lord commissioned the clone army, yet the Jedi still have no problem relying on them to save the Republic. Why on earth would they accept the clone army when they are commissioned by a Sith Lord and they don't know why? Also, they are aware that a Sith Lord has deep power within the Republic, and multiple times they talk about the dark side surrounding the Chancellor and how he is refusing to give up his powers. Jeez. Maybe the Chancellor is the guy who is the secret Sith Lord. And I know this is from the Clone Wars, but they literally see a malfunctioned clone kill a Jedi randomly and think nothing of it. To me, there is a difference between the Jedi losing their way and falling versus the Jedi becoming complete idiots and falling. The prequels are more about the Jedi being morons rather than losing their way to me. To wrap up this section of the video, I want to discuss the effect great world building has on a franchise. When you have great world building, people become more invested in the franchise rather than the particular movie they just watched. Star Wars has an endless rabbit hole of lore you can explore if you so choose to. Lucas was a genius. He put all this random shit in the prequels like the certain Jedi or the specific planets that only appear briefly, or a scene talking about people from the past. He then went to other people and said, go ahead and tell stories with these characters or these places. You can watch whole videos on people like Kit Fisto, a dude who died like a bitch in Revenge of the Sith. Or you can read an entire book on Darth Plagueis, a book many regard as one of the best Star Wars novels. If you want to play games as a random clone squadron, you can do that as well. If you want to watch an entire seven season show about the events between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, you can also do that. Now, Star Wars has done one aspect of its world building and lore that almost no other franchise has done, and that's the variety of eras you can choose to explore. If you're an older Star Wars fan that hates the sequels, that's fine. You can consume all the media of the prequel era, or the original trilogy era, or even the old Republic era. Say you are a fan of Disney Star Wars, you can now read the plethora of High Republic books that exist. There are so many different ways to be a Star Wars fan. You can be someone who's only seen the nine main movies and you're still a fan. Or you can be someone who reads every new canon book and spends their free time watching lore videos to learn more about Thurm Scissor Punch. The world that Lucas and others have built has consumed so many people, and I feel this expansive world building really started with the prequel trilogy. For that, I am eternally grateful. So, with Attack of the Clones discussed and its impact on the franchise analyzed, which movie is better, The Phantom Menace or Attack of the Clones? 55% of you guys said The Phantom Menace. It makes sense to me why most of you would choose this movie. It definitely has more of a cult following to it than Attack of the Clones does. To many, there is more nostalgia there because it was their first Star Wars movie. But do I agree with these people? My vote for the better film is going to go to... Attack of the Clones. Both movies have questionable plot lines, but the character work in Attack of the Clones 
Bones is much better. Sure, it is cringe at times, but at least the movie attempted to develop its characters, while The Phantom Menace did almost nothing. So what do you guys think? 21 years after its release, have I convinced you that Attack of the Clones is better than The Phantom Menace? Let me know down below. Thank you everyone so much for watching another one of my videos. Don't forget to like the Claude Squad, and I will see you guys next time.